Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole Milano, and I'm the head of the Medical Center Archives at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medicine. I want to thank you all for joining us for our first Heberden Society session of the 2021-2022 academic year. The Heberden Society is a history of medicine lecture series first organized at Weill Cornell Medicine in 1975. Now, before I hand things over to our moderator for tonight's panel, I do have a few announcements to make. The first is that I would invite you to join us for the remaining three Heberden Society lectures this academic year. On December 14th, Dr. Howard Markell will be speaking about his new book, which provides a lively narrative of the landmark discovery of the double helix structure of DNA, a story of genius and perseverance, but also a saga of cronyism, misogyny, anti-Semitism, and misconduct. On March 30th, Dr. Susan Clark Ball, who serves as Assistant Director of the Birnbaum Unit at the Center for Special Studies at New York Presbyterian Hospital, will be reflecting on her work in combating the AIDS crisis, more than 40 years after the identification of the first cases of what would later become known as AIDS. Finally, Dr. Keith Weilu of Princeton University pulls back the curtain to reveal the hidden persuaders who shaped menthol cigarette buying habits and racial markets across America on April 27th. I'll be sending out more information regarding these upcoming lectures and registration for them following tonight's panel. Now, if you're interested in the history of the New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center, I would invite you to explore the website for our very own Medical Center archives. The archive includes photographs and documents dating all the way back to 1771, including this hospital annual report from 1797. Thousands of these photographs and documents are digitized and available for reference through the link seen here. Now, I would invite you all to participate in the Q&A following tonight's panel. You'll find a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen where you can enter a question and we'll get to as many as possible following tonight's panel. And on that note, I'll turn the virtual microphone over to the moderator for tonight's event, who is a fellow member of the Heberden Society Committee and also an associate professor of clinical medicine, and the Associate Dean of Faculty Development at Weill Cornell Medicine, Dr. Judy Tung. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you um, to our audience for joining us today on this panel discussion, reflecting on the medical response to September 11th, 20 years later. It's really hard to believe that 20 years have passed since September 11th of 2001. And for those of us who were adults on that horrible day, where we were, who we were with, and how we felt as the day unfolded are memories and sensations that we will never forget and that rise swiftly and vividly to the surface every 9-11 anniversary. This anniversary, 20 years, is sobering to acknowledge 20 years is almost in adulthood, which means that many of our medical students and even residents and fellows may not recollect living through that time and do not know of the incredible roles that healthcare workers and first responders, including those from New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell, played in the disaster response. And this is why the Heberden Society has chosen to host tonight's panel to ensure that we remember and honor the people that we lost and remember and thank the people who gave. Three of such individuals we are honored to host tonight, Dr. Bruce Logan, Dr. Tony Dahir, and Ms. Barbara Richwood, played pivotal roles in that medical response and are here to share their story. So I'm honored to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Bruce Logan. Dr. Logan graduated from Colby College, obtained his medical degree from Columbia School of Medicine, trained in internal medicine, and is a, a clinical associate professor of medicine. He has held a variety of executive leadership positions, including chair of medicine, senior vice president of ambulatory and emergency services, chief medical officer. But very importantly, in 2001, Bruce was the president and CEO of New York Downtown Hospital, the hospital closest, maybe five miles away from the World Trade Centers as they collapsed and the hospital that we now know as the New York Presbyterian Lower Manhattan Hospital. Dr. Logan coordinated the hospital's response, not only for the victims on the day of the attack, in the search efforts of the ensuing weeks, 
but also for the whole lower Manhattan community who were stranded without power, clean air, and basic necessities for a very long time. Dr. Logan, can you share with us your experience on that September 11th day? What was that like? And is there a moment that stands out to you the most either on the day or in the weeks that followed? I'd like to give you a little bit of history of the hospital first. 9-11 um, was not the first terrorist attack in lower Manhattan. At noon on September 16, 1920, a horse-drawn wagon filled with dynamite and metal weights exploded on Wall Street in front of the J.P. Morgan building. 38 people died and hundreds were injured. The force of the blast was so great that it blew out windows over half a mile away. The, perpetra the perpetrators of this terrorist attack, at attack were never discovered. However, this act of terrorism was the critical event that resulted in the establishment of Beekman Hospital, which is the predecessor of New York Presbyterian Lower Manhattan Hospital. There were other terrorist attempts at attacks in Lower Manhattan. On January 24th, 1975, a bomb exploded at Francis Tavern, killing four and injuring seven. On February 26, 1993, a van loaded with more than a thousand pounds of explosives blew up in the parking lot of the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Six people were killed and hundreds were injured, many of them coming to downtown hospital for treatment. On September 11, 2001, two hijacked planes crashed into the World Trade Center towers. 2,801 individuals were killed and thousands were injured. At 8.46, the first hijacked plane crashes into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. At that time, the medical staff and medical residents were gathered in the boardroom for grand rounds. One of the department of medicine administrators was in the back of the room, which had a direct view of the World Trade Center. She alerted everyone that a plane or a helicopter had struck the World Trade Center. None of us at that time realized that it was a terrorist attack, but we quickly mobilized for a possible influx of injured patients. At 8.50, the hospital declared a code yellow and activates the emergency management plan. By 9 a.m., hundreds of injured people are on their way to downtown hospital. At 9.30 a.m., a second plane crashes into the South Tower. Now we know for sure that this is a terrorist attack. The true horror of this situation becomes evident as people are climbing out of the windows on the World Trade Center and jumping to their deaths. I, I must warn you that some of the audience will find these images very disturbing. Mass casualties arrive at the hospital requiring the cafeteria and the clinics to be converted for emergency care. At 10.05, the South Tower collapses. At 10.28, the North Tower collapses. Everyone tries to run for safety as a cloud of dust and debris rolls over lower Manhattan like a tidal wave. And as everyone tries to run to safety, the firefighters are rushing to the World Trade Center site. As well as the police and the paramedics. Remember that at this time, we did not know there would be more attacks. Over 500 people seek refuge at the hospital.
The hospital continues to triage patients and transport injured, injured victims. Lower Manhattan loses electricity and telephone service. The hospital's generator holds up in the crisis and we are the only ones downtown with the lights on. As the day goes by, I have an eerie, sickening feeling, which I know that Tony shared with me because we stood in front of the emergency room at this time and talked about it. It soon became clear that there would be no more survivors being rescued from under the rubble. As I say, I felt at the time a, a real physical sickness as, as I came to that realization. The hospital received on 9-11, 375 patients within the first two hours. They treated hundreds of unregistered patients. 24 patients were admitted, nine emergency operations performed, 24 transfers to other hospitals, some to the burn unit at Cornell. And they were the most terrible to see and take care of. Three dead on arrival patients, two subsequent deaths. We sent 22 people to the World Trade Center sites for triage. As everyone knows, New York was completely closed. Over the next week, the hospital provided emergency medical treatment to over 150 injured firefighters and rescue workers. They provided thousands of meals to rescue workers, volunteers, victims, and local residents. We provided medications and home visits to elderly residents trapped in their apartments. And we provided shuttle services for patients, visitors, and employees using the hospital vehicles. One thing that really hasn't changed uh, since that time. I am still advising people to wear masks, but it's for obviously different reasons. I was very concerned that the air quality in lower Manhattan was not good in spite of official assurances. In the weeks after 9-11, Lower Manhattan was shut off from the rest of the city, except for residents and the firefighters and others who worked on the pile, many who unfortunately did not wear masks. During that period, the hospital was not very busy, so I had some time to pass out masks and encourage workers to wear them. On May, on March 11, 2002, the mayor declared New York Downtown Hospital Day in recognition of the most extensive in the history of the country taken by our hospital. As I say, I, as I look back at this time, there were just all kinds of emotions, which we can talk about later on that all of us have. But the incredible thing was how the hospital held together during that day to take care of patients. It was really, truly extraordinary. Thank you, Bruce, for that um, very visceral story. Um, I can only imagine what, uh, you and your team experienced um, in those weeks. Um, I too remember that sick pit in my gut. Um, it was my first year at Wild Cornell and um, all providers cleared their duties um, to rush into the emergency room, uh, ready to receive whoever came. And uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to receive as many as we had hoped. Um, I'd like to invite our second panelist, uh, Dr. Tony Dyer, to um, share his experience. Uh, Tony um, received his bachelor's um, at Harvard, his medical doctorate at NYU, 
trained in emergency medicine and is currently an assistant professor of clinical emergency medicine, the director of quality assurance and coordinator for undergraduate medical education. Tony was also a former emergency department site chief at Lower Manhattan Hospital. And importantly, on September 11th, 2001, was the assistant director of the emergency department at New York Downtown Hospital and the attending on shift that led the ED team to treat hundreds of injured individuals. Tony. Thank you, Judy. Um, the, the, my goal to complement Bruce's talk is to give a sense of what the immediacy of that response was, that as soon as we heard that the towers had been hit, what exactly we did and how we mobilized. And so let me try to walk you through that, what it felt like to respond to a sudden influx of hundreds of patients as the towers were on fire and then collapsing. So Art, next. <clears throat> and again, the, the, um, the World Trainer site, the, the hospital was only four blocks away from the world child, from the from the towers. So, I mean, literally we, we saw and heard the plane hit the towers. Next. Um, that's just a quick scheme map of the area. You, you can see the proximity next. Next. So as Bruce pointed out, that it, we are we are the smallest hospital in Manhattan, 170 beds with six operating rooms. At the time, we were seeing 80 patients a day in the ED. Next, <clears throat> and again, Bruce covered the history very well. Next, um, and one thing that certainly Bruce was a leader on was making sure that after the 93 bombing, that we were all trained in incident command systems that the disaster planning was very extensive in the hospital. There was a, a very high alertness to the fact that we were sitting on a bullseye. Next. 9-11, next. You know, the one, the one thing that I think is a big take home that we learned on that day was that, as Bruce said, this was the largest disaster response in American history by a single hospital, but we, but we were not overwhelmed. And a lot of disaster planning takes hospitals as sort of the weak link in the disaster response that we're somehow fragile, that patients need to be diverted away from us, that patients should be treated in the field. But our experience on 9-11 completely negated that, that you should bring as in a disaster response, all patients belong in a hospital next. You know, there was a lot of field triage. Patients were being treated at the scene. New York City has its protocols for documenting patients' names and other data. And that proved to be in some cases lethal because patients stayed at the site too long. Next. You know, when, when we heard the word that the towers had been hit and the disaster response was alerted, I remember, you know, personally, I, this is a little bit silly. I was in the bathroom and someone had paged overhead that we needed respiratory therapy in the ED. And I remember thinking, wait, I'm, I'm the only ED attending on duty right now. And I'm the one that calls those. So I, kind of stumbled out and one of our nurses was running through the ED announcing that the towers had been hit. So we knew immediately that it was a major event. And there was a mad scramble to set up supplies in the central area to get things organized, to set up the triage stations. We had 12 admitted patients who, again, this is a bit of an irony, were immediately taken upstairs in five minutes. And uh, our, you know, we never let uh, the Department of Medicine live that down. Um, but it was quickly a matter of how to organize in 10 minutes and, and meet a, a vast influx of casualties next. You know, was, I was the sole ED attending on duty at the time. Our charge nurse was Mary Like. We had six nurses for the ED. And again, it was a month, it was a Tuesday morning. So there were many staff in the hospital, you know, internal medicine, surgeons, and OBGYN. At the time we had a freestanding medicine program. So we had a number of our own house staff already there next. You know, in the first minutes, my, my most vivid memory of that day is going out to the triage area and bringing the house staff with me while Mary Like set up indoors and got supplies organized and the treatment station set up. And suddenly we had a minute to pause and sort of wonder if we were going to get any patients. And then all of a sudden, a crowd of people came running around the corner. And I was supposed to try tie triage tags around their necks. 
um, which was of course useless. I mean, imagine this crowd of people coming right at you, all of them needing care. Um, protocol is tag them as they go, but that I just tossed the tags and the house staff proved to be invaluable for that because I assigned each one of them to each patient as they came in with instructions of where to go back. And again, then they're all, they're all physicians at the time. Um, they were able to reassess the patients and identify significant injuries as they went. So chest tubes, uh, pneumothoraces, surgical airways were all identified immediately by the house staff as they brought these patients back into the triage areas and the treatment areas next. Um, Art, next, sorry. Um, next. You know, the area that we had to work with was about half the size of the current emergency department. It was about 10,000 square feet with five slots in the middle um, for trauma. We had one recess room at the bottom here and then six and eight rooms on the side. So it was pretty small, small ED. And we immediately got hundreds of patients next. The chronology of the towers getting hit in rapid succession next. 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 You know, and what, what we found quickly is that ED nurses were, of course, invaluable. I mean, they were the ones that knew where to go, knew where the supplies were, knew, you know, had the clinical skills to take care of these severely injured patients. Um, I found myself mostly pointing fingers where I had worked, I, my shift, I had been on duty in 1993 at St. Vincent. So I had actually worked the first trade center attack. And I remember at the time being in a treatment area in the back where, we had a lot of casualties. I came out at one point and saw three or four ED attendings at the entrance waving ambulances through and thinking, you need to be sure you don't cluster, that there's some, someone has to be in charge in a disaster response and spread people out, make sure they're allocated to where they're, they're most useful. Um, as patients came in, a second ED attending also arrived, Tony Azar, who in the cafeteria stood on a chair and announced, I'm in charge here. This is how we're going to do it and set up lacerations stations and asthma stations. And so it, medical people, you know, we're all well-trained nurses, docs, PAs, the ancillary staff all know what to do if you just direct them and keep things organized. And that's what we found worked really well. Keep the next. That's the cafeteria where everyone, again, some of these, the people in this, in this photo are OBGYN residents who were obviously excellent at suturing. Next. More of that. Next. And the one, the one magical event of 9-11 was, and this is not well known, is that 99% of the people below the impact areas survived, that the experience of 1993 had taught the, the managers of the towers and the transit police, the firefighters and the New York City, the NYPD, that the paramount, the paramount goal in any kind of evacuation in the disaster response is evacuation. And so we, as Bruce was describing, that no more patients were gonna come out, that we thought, that there were times we thought 30,000 people potentially could die in the towers. We knew you know, that was the daytime population of the Twin Towers. Um, you know, so catastrophic as to be unimaginable, but the miracle was that because of the planning and the re reinforcing of the evacuation um, facilities in the towers, 99% of the people got out. Next. So by 9.50, um, we had 375 patients in the hospital next. Um, you know, our, our initial cases were very severe. There were degloving injuries where you know, patients had flayed open um, buttocks and, and legs. Uh, the burns as Bruce described were horrendous. There were blunt trauma to head and chest injuries. So we needed trauma surgeons and trauma care right away. The, the first patient I saw that day was the 30 year old who had such severe injuries, but the initial response was to try to amputate her legs, but actually calmer heads prevailed and she was, they were saved and she did well eventually. Next. <coughs> the South Tower collapsed at 9.50. Now a dust cloud engulfed us as Bruce described next. The whole other set of injuries occurred, you know, inhalation injuries and crushed injuries next. And we thought we had to close the hospital, but we couldn't close the hospital. So we set up airlocks to try to keep the smoke out as much as possible. Ongoing debates about whether it was safe to keep patients in the hospital next. And I'll conclude in just a second. And we, we became a shelter for hundreds of people trying to get out of the clouds next. 
Next. Next. You know, our decontamination area was this little shower in the, in the parking lot. Next. You know, we transferred a dozen, two dozen patients uptown. Um, and again, people mobilized. And the, the thing I, I want to leave you with, and again, my time's up here, is how quickly and well everyone coordinated together that as a small hospital where we all knew each other and all trusted each other, that co the coordination and the speed with which everybody responded to this disaster was unbelievable. You would, you would be hard pressed to understand how well people work together when they're going full tilt and they know exactly what to do when they're well directed. And so we can say, I think with authority, and I think Bruce can corroborate this, is that as far as we know, no patient went untreated on 9-11. There were no injuries that were worse, were worse or, or lethal because they did not receive the care that the patients needed. We met the care. We took care of everybody at the standard of care for a modern American hospital. Next. One more, go, we'll go one more. One more. Um, one more. You know, at the five o'clock, the power went out because the OEM was in trade in World Trade Center seven, and that was damaged because the North Tower had collapsed onto it. The city had built the OEM in that site against a lot of people thinking it was a bad idea. The transformers in the basement were destroyed and that blacked out lower Manhattan for six days, generating the problems that Bruce described and that the hospital met so well. Uh, next, that was the scene going down that night to try to rescue the transit worker, the transit cop, next. And you know, the way we rebuilt, and, and Bruce deserves a lot of credit for this, as well as the, the other leadership of the hospital is, you know, the community helped us rebuild. And this is the largest econ shower in New York City, built to compensate for that little dinky shower that we had. Um, taking care of the community in the aftermath was also paramount and next story. But also emotionally, I'll leave you with this, is that the most, the most two things that impressed me the most about 9-11 were people who were in the thick of it, who I saw saving lives nonstop, all had the same reaction the next day is that they hadn't done enough, that they hadn't done anything worthwhile. So that sense of inadequacy is a very powerful feeling that you need to anticipate. The second thing is it's so fast and so anonymous that you don't have time to bond with your patients and get to know them. And so in the aftermath of 9-11, we we, I think all of us tried to reach out to each other and share our own stories and also reach out to the patients that we had seen and continue our relationships with them. And there's one family in particular that I'm still in touch with that has been very important for me to continue that bond of having shared that day. So I wanna stop with that. Thank you. Tony, thank you so much for your humility, for your um, heroics, um, and for sharing that uh, deeply personal story. Um, our last panelist is Ms. Barbara Richwood, um, who on September 11th um, uh, worked as a nurse in the burn unit at New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell and continued to serve victims of the World Trade Center attacks for weeks after. Ms. Richwood received her bachelor's at the New Jersey City University, her nursing degree through Christ Hospital School of Nursing, um, and has held several prominent roles at New York Presbyterian Hospital as staff nurse, charge nurse, winning charge nurse of the year, and instructor. Um, and she also belongs to the Association of Critical Care Nurses. So Mitch, Barbara, will you share with us your experience? Yes, thank you for having me. Um, September 11th is a day that I will never, ever forget. For the mere fact that on that day, I actually commuted from Jersey City on the PATH train. So I took the 606 as usual, because I had worked here for 10 years on uh, that day. And I go up the double escalators you know, escalator one, escalator two, cross, uh, cross the concourse, do my normal exit out of six World Trade Center, but I have to stop, look at the Rolex watches and say, one day, one day. I cross the street, pass the Millennium Hotel, make a right and say, oh, Century 21, maybe I'll stop there tomorrow, pick something up, go back down Fulton Street and take the uh, number four uptown. Usual day done it for 10 years, thinking, huh, 
my usual 11 minutes, Journal Square to World Trade Center. So I get to the, you know, get to the job, get report, you know, doing your normal day of chit chatting, and then you know, night shift. Some people are still there, and it's like 8:30. My patient's watching like the Today Show, Good Morning America, and I look up and I'm like. Did I just see a plane at the World Trade Center? I'm like, so I like step out of the room and I'm like, I think nobody needs to go home. If this is really happening, I believe that a plane just hit the World Trade Center. I'm like, no way, are you crazy? Then the phones start ringing. Okay, so red phone, warden phones ringing, phones are ringing off and there are overhead announcement and the, actually the night assistant nurse manager is still there. And I'm like, I, I don't think you're going home. I think this is gonna be like a very crazy day. So it, out of nowhere, it, cause at that time, the burn unit on uh, eight West, the 20 beds was an ICU unit dealing with peds as well as adult patients. And we also had the step down, which was eight South. So we had the capacity to have 40 patients. Out of the blue, medical team arrives. Whatever patients could be moved, were moved. Vented patients disappeared. Pediatric vents disappeared. I was like, wow, this is like amazing. Housekeeping, supplies. When I tell you the mobilization of the team, yeah, physical therapists started opening up burn stations, start priming IV pumps because Burn resuscitation, I mean, these people are going to be getting liters and liters of fluid. And, you know, supplies, beds, cleaning. And we were, were waiting. You know, you saw the plane hit and we're like, okay, how many do you think we're going to get? You know, this, this could be crazy. Nothing happened for half an hour. Then like 45 minutes. Then patients start coming. And each room... They had a, basically cleared out, I believe, maybe 16 of the 20 beds. And in each room of the ICU, there was a doctor, there was a nurse, and there was some form of ancillary, a PA, a tech, a therapist. So my particular room was room 27. And when I tell you, when these patients came in, they came in still talking, but they looked like they were dipped in wax. You didn't know if they were African-American. You didn't know if they were Asian. You didn't know their nationalities. Their eyes, face, it was just a, a dip. So my particular patient had very bad facial burns, kind of come from the collar all the way around, almost circumferential at the neck and both of his hands and a toe tag, still talking to me. And I'm like, okay, I write on my scrubs, what's your name? What's your date of birth? Do you have any allergies? And who can I contact? What's the number and what's the name? I think that may have been 10 o'clock. So everybody winds up getting bronched, getting intubated. Some people needed escharotomies. Some people had open bellies. Uh, I believe mine winds up getting escharotomies, A line, and a central line. So each room, and of course, the burn patients. And as your largest organ, all the rooms, all the doors are closed. Everyone's pretty much in their own quiet little setting. And all the rooms have to be hot because everybody's cold and, and burnt from, I believe, 40% to 90% burned. So in my room, it was myself. It was a physical therapist. And for the love of me, I can't remember the doctor's name. <laughs> I can remember everything else. And I actually saw the therapist today. I was like, do you remember the name of the doctor that was in the room? She's like, no. I was like, oh. So fast forward, I think I came out and in the hallways, you saw pumps and burn care being set up. Pharmacy was standing there giving out, you need dopamine, you need butamine, you need fentanyl, you need Ativan. It was just like a clockwork. And in the background, you're hearing humming of the pumps because they're running it two, three liters an hour. So you're hearing me, then you're hearing Ben's alarm goes off. You're smelling. The smells of that day are so intense that it smelled like gasoline, like 
pure gasoline if you're like pumping your car. So also what I got from my patient is like, where were you at? You know, what was your location? And he told me he was actually in the lobby of, of the World Trade Center and the door opened up and he was standing next to another person who was actually admitted to. And when the door opened up, it was just a fireball that gushed out at him and as well as the other person. I was like, wow, you know, totally like crazy. So the day, I don't know, it was kind of like fast forward. The phone, like if I did step out, it was to get the phone. People were calling who used to work here years ago. Do you need help? I'll come in. People were walking across the Brooklyn Bridge. They were walking from like 115th Street. They're like, I'm coming. You know, I want to help. And there's nothing more greater than like coming together because in the beginning, before the assistance and everything kicked in, we literally were like immediately swamped. Like the burns take time. Burns, everybody was getting swanned back in the old days, swanning people. No more, you know, Pico wasn't there yet. And so a lot of them in that time, it kind of reminds me of COVID in a sense because they wound up having, we wound up flipping these patients. So you're doing a 40% burn, hemodynamics, turning them every 12 hours with two beds and on multiple drips, epi, levofed, dopa. I mean, the patients were intense. If you got out of your room to go to the bathroom, <laughs> you were lucky. I did get out of my room and it was six o'clock. So I didn't even know that the towers had collapsed. I thought they had went down at like six o'clock and I'm like, oh my God, you know, this happens at like 10 o'clock and now it's like six o'clock. And so, you know, my patient's all settled and I think it's like a little low. So I wind up um, calling the patient's wife. And actually before they did the escharotomies, he wound up having his wedding bands on his hand. And I said, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this off, you know, before your hand swells too much. And I wind up putting on um, his wedding bands on my thumb. So I had it like on all day. And when I call his wife at 6.30, I'm like, hi, my name, you know, my name is Barbara. I'm a nurse at Cornell. And I, you know, want to tell you your husband is here. And all you heard was like screaming. And she was like, oh my God, he's alive. And like the phone drops. And like, I just want to like bowl. I'm like, oh. And she comes back to the line. She's like, oh my God, is he okay? I said, you know, if he's okay, he's on the vent, you know, he's stable for now. He's got really significant burns, but you know, he is here. She's like, I got to get there. I was like, I don't know if you can get here, but if you can, I, you know, you know, you know, do your best, but otherwise he's okay. So, you know, and it, just to even like talk to the wife and just to relay that message, knowing that the tower had come down, it was just so like emotional. And the weird thing is I hadn't seen this person, you know, after years and years and we had a little ceremony and I was like, oh my God, this is the first time that I'm seeing you after the fact. And the wife had kept his wedding band and uh, she had it around her neck, you know, on the chain. So I'll, you know, ever, forever be in, uh, indebted to them, you know, for that experience, but working uh, nonstop that actually night I wound up staying and I actually didn't go home for three months. <laughs> I like worked till midnight. Um, we were put in the Helmsley Tower. I say that I was like the professional Helmsley Tower liver in the apartment. And I actually didn't even go outside. I went through the tunnel. So I kind of worked 13 of the 14 days. I just kept on working. And the working kept me, it, it kept me busy because knowing the fact that I could have been one of these people in that building. I mean, if I was off, maybe I would have went to <laughs> shopping and I would have been there at that time. And when you get to find out everyone's stories, one walked down from the 93rd floor, somebody actually was running into the hotel of the lobby of the Millennium Hotel after they got hit with some shrapnel to get into the lobby of the Millennium Hotel. And then like a wheel came off and hit them. So they were burned as well as trauma. We had uh, another family member, her sisters, they would always drink. So it's like, I knew everybody's story and 
at one point we had like two codes going on at the same time. And I'm like, this is crazy, you know, what, what's happening? But this one particular lady, she's coding and I'm, I'm actually begging her, looking into her eyes. I'm like, you are not going today, not today. And you see the life in her eyes just blinking. We also had another- Those are amazing stories. Yeah, and so uh, thank you so much for the, a very moving account. Um, I'm gonna um, uh, open up for Q and A, um, but take the liberty perhaps of the first question um, for any one of our panelists. Um, if you could uh, maybe bring us back to the present um, uh, and share with us how you feel that the events of 9-11 affected um, our current medical practice, whether there are any lasting impacts or lessons learned um, to share. And in fact, there's already a question about um, perhaps um, its relationship to the way that we had to pivot quickly during the COVID response. I, I think that not only the events of 9-11 but the extreme weather events, the um, hurricanes, the flooding and so forth have all made us aware that uh, emergency preparedness is incredibly important um, for, for our country and for hospitals in, in, in general. Um, I think that part of the reason that we were able to respond the way we did um, was based upon the fact that most of the hospital staff had been trained in the previous year in the incident command system. So, in you know, training and, and being prepared, I think is really a, a, the great key to being able to respond to these terrible events. Um, the other thing was the, the great leadership we had in the emergency room, not only with the doctors, but with also the nurses. Um, the nurses were absolutely key because there were more of them than, than the emergency room doctors. There were more, uh, for instance, the, many of the medical resident staff, you know, took their orders in a sense or went to the nurses for advice just the way they went to the doctors. So the, the incredible teamwork that, that existed at that period of time and as Tony said, a part of it is that in our case, we were a small hospital and we all knew each other and we had all trained together. But this kind of, this, the importance of training and, and being able to communicate, I think is extremely important. It, it also, I think for disaster planning, one of the things that certainly sharpened in my own mind was, and this sounds very trivial, but the importance of power and communication. If you look at Fukushima, for instance, the, the reason those reactors exploded is because the generators were too low, that they were below the level of the tsunami. And, you know, Katrina was a failure of evacuation. I mean, they're very simple principles of disaster management that have failed to be implemented in, in, in other events and that we learned on 9-11. You know, even on 9-11, I think the issue of did the fire department and the police department speak to each other? You know, the, they had different communication systems. And again, not it's difficult to criticize what happened on 9-11, but there's a chance that many firefighters would have been saved if they had known the towers looked so unstable from the police choppers. And so key lessons like that, I think we learned on 9-11. And preparation to Bruce's point, we drilled Again, it was annoying. We always complained about it, but we drilled and we trained and we took those class. You know, we and we had ninety three as the as the motivation. You know, we knew that there was a good chance this would happen again, and so we took advantage of that. What was incre incredible, uh, actually, after the fact, which is uh, at least it was incredible to me, is that you know. As Tony said, we were going to have an emergency room of 10,000 square feet enlarged a little bit. And then we decided we, because of the terrorist attacks that had happened in lower Manhattan and might happen again, we needed to have a really first rate emergency room, which turned out to be about 25,000 feet. 
And we wanted to have a decontamination center. And it turns out that we built the biggest decontamination center in the city. But we couldn't get funding for it. We only got, that emergency room cost $25 million. We only got $2,500,000 from the city, state, and federal government. I mean, I went to, mm. I went, <laughs> I spoke, I went to the state, I went to the, to the federal government, met with our congressmen, I met with our senators. And you would have thought that that would have been a no brainer to fund something like a decontamination center in the, you know, the cap, the, the, the financial capital of the world. The money wasn't forthcoming. And it really was gifts from the Wall Street area mainly and a, and a big gift of $5 million from Lehman Brothers that made that emergency room be able to be built. I think we're seeing the playing out of some uh, slowness in necessary resources in the COVID pandemic as well. Um, there's actually two questions on technology and whether you're, you feel that the advancement of technology now um, either help could could have helped or could have hindered um, the response. Um, you know, we're very tethered right now to our electronic systems, even to releasing medications and ordering medications. And what do you think the role of technology um, has in in the disaster response? I think you just you should assume it's all going to go down. <laughs> I can just imagine how you could possibly deal with. You know, we had so many patients that there was there's no documentation on. You know, the yeah. people who had, you know, just needed a few stitches or needed their eyes cleaned out or whatever. There was no documentation yeah. for any of those patients. I think to your point, Jude, I know, I think for Katrina, during the evacuation, patients in the VA system, because they have their records centralized when they were transferred to, when they went to other cities or other hospitals, they were able to pull up their records. And so I think technology from that aspect of having a cloud, so to speak, of having records and ways of accessing patients' histories and, uh, and other, other means is, is, a, is a pretty key thing. To point, Bruce's point about documentation, some of the docs were actually happy they didn't have the document. You know, it, it's perverse how we react. It was like, great, I can just do medicine and not have to worry about the documentation. But it is critical. You need, to, you know, we, we, we regretted that later. There's two you other bet. points that I just like to get across very quickly. One is the incredible admiration we all had for the fire, the firefighters yeah. and for the other the police and, and, and our emergency technicians who were driving, you know, their ambulances into this, this terrible chaos there and, and many who, who didn't survive. It was incredible, the, the, the real bravery that these encouraged that these people demonstrated. The second thing I would say, we live in a time now that's, as far as I'm concerned, the most divided time the country has ever been in during my lifetime. It's, it's not even close to the, to the Vietnam War. The polarization of the country is, is, so, is, is so great. Um, after the period of 9-11, that was, it was a period of time like any other I've, for, for several months, at least, maybe longer, that I've ever experienced in the country. I mean, there was no issue about if you were Republican or Democrat, if you were Black, White, Hispanic, maybe it was different for, for people of Muslim um, uh, background. But there was, there was just, everybody was an American and everybody was trying to help. Everybody was trying to help. And it was, it was an amazing experience to go through that time. Yeah, I will definitely attest to that commonality um, with the COVID response um, and how wonderful it was to break down some of those silos and have, um, um, you know, dermatologists and pediatricians and people practicing uh, critical care medicine because that was what was needed um, in the in the care of patients and and clearly uh, Tony you told some of those stories from 9 11. Um, I have a question um, actually for Mr. Richwood um, wondering if you could share 
um, some of the common conditions that you saw um, in your patients um, after New York City was shut down um, and the sequelae, perhaps not just of the acute injuries, but of the later ones? Well, the burn victims needed multiple surgeries. Um, some of them were having surgery, escarotomies, open belly, you know, one day, next day, like three days in a row. So, I mean, um, skin grafting was the major. And I believe the last patient left maybe three, like three or four months later, you know, uh, a lot of the inhalation injuries when they were, you know, repeat bronching, we had a lot of pneumonias. That was like the advent of a Acinerobacter. And um, like I said before, the proning of patients and <laughs> it, it was just really an intense time. Uh, like I thought that would be the most influential, most impactful thing that would ever happen in a career. And then you get COVID, you know, during that time, it was more of a communal thing. You could bond and you can talk with others. To me, COVID was you're afraid for yourself. You're afraid for your family. You know, that whole, if I help them, am I going to get sick too? So it's kind of, you know, indifferent. You, you want to help. And then you're annoyed at the people who think it's a joke. You know, I think common people need to walk into the hospital and see that it's not fake. People are being transferred from one unit to another with a Lucas machine running, you know, and you don't want a vaccine. I'm wearing a mask for you, for me, and for everybody else. But when you get sick, you want to come to us. You want help. So I, I, I have a lot of ambivalence, you know, towards caring for people right now. You know, I love nursing. I love to help people, but help us. A lot of people are retired and if this is gonna happen again, you know? There's interest in the crowd as to how perhaps potentially they could help. So um, maybe for Tony, who's involved in education, do you think there, there's a useful way to train non-medical workers? to have a role in emergencies or is that better left to the experts? No, I think I would reiterate what Bruce said. I think that, you know, it's, it's almost like teaching hands only CPR. There are such basic phenomenal interventions you can teach lay people that are life-saving and simple um, and give them a mental map of what to do when, when things like this happen that like evacuation of how important evacuation is, how important backup power systems are, you know, again, basic first aid on top of CPR that, mm -hmm. that everybody needs to know what their place might be and anticipate that. I, I definitely don't think it's just left to the experts. You need to empower people. And, and actually after 9-11, Bruce, you probably were involved with some of this where there were a lot of uh, communal community groups organizing for disaster response to get some training in it not just first aid, but also in you know incident command system, and where they, what their role would be in a future response, like taking food and medicine to people trapped in high-rise buildings. You know, how do you who do you call? Where do you go? What are your communication systems? What is in your community that you can tap into? Crit critical, very important, and very and very simple. Um, for. Um, staff who identified as Muslim. Um, I don't know if you have any stories, um, recollections to share regarding how challenging of a period of time it was for that community. Wasn't an issue in the hospital. I can't speak to what went on outside the hospital, mm -hmm. but it was not an issue in the hospital. There was a, a, a car, a, a cle the, the, there was a real bond between everybody was trying to we had the same mission to try to mm -hmm. do something we all had the same goals and so forth and I don't think that there was any issue whatsoever as far as I, I could see in, in the hospital at all I, as I say I can't speak to what happened outside the hospital 
I think I think maybe adding to that one thought about 9-11, I think Barbara, you touched on this some as well, is you know, the empowerment of 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 the medical world that you know, my initial point about hospitals being the the weak the weak link in a disaster response being completely false, that they're really, you know, that we are, we are resilient and know what we're doing. You know, I think that applies on a larger scale as well. When, you know, when Bruce speaks about the, the unity after 9-11, but when you look at the levels of leadership in the country, you know, so much of what's happened with COVID is challenging medical authority or who should have primacy, whether it's science and medicine or it's a, the political appointees that we as a medical community need to have a louder voice and need to not just show our own competence, but also our clout that we are leaders of all of this, that we're not just the passive recipients of casualties, mm -hmm. um, I think is a critical point. And we have not spoken loudly enough since 9-11 and certainly now to, to take our proper place at that table. Definitely. I agree completely. This is our lane. Mm -hmm. It is our lane. Yes. Stay in your lane. We'll take all the help. You can come into it, but listen, listen. Well, it was hilarious. In 9-11, we were the only, as Bruce said, we were the only building in town with lights and the command post for the cops and the EMS were in these little tents and vans outside and were saying, we have space and lights. Come in, come in to the hospital. You know, we are the most resilient entity here. Um, and that, that applies across the board. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Um, and so I want to conclude and thank um, the three of you for um, this very rich um, uh, recounting. Um, I know that we've all learned from it and have, we'll, we'll think deeply um, as we move into the next couple of uh, weeks and months about how we've all been changed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.